to start with is that we all know that fish are friends, but they're also food, okay? <laughs> and so Nemo taught us this best. Also, their world, worldwide resource and Food and Agriculture Organization in 2014 told us that 167 million tons of fish were produced around the world. And that generated over $148 billion in exports, and that accounted for about 17% of the total animal global protein. And so that's a pretty big deal. But this can't last forever because two-thirds of the world's fish are overfished and depleting, according to the UN in 2015. So how do we protect them? Well, in order to protect fishes, we need to understand all of their different life stages and all of the ecosystems associated with those life stages. So in this photo here, you can see that some fishes use different habitats as they're growing. And so they give birth to these eggs, these eggs turn into larvae, larvae turn into juveniles, and juveniles turn into adults. And these different habitats, we need to understand them because we need to understand how to protect them. And so we need to focus our conservation efforts on areas, including, for this particular talk, eggs. So how do we study lar life stages? Well, early life stages include larvae, and a lot of times people identify larvae based off of fins and spines, based off of where the mouth is situated, also how many myomeres they have, and the coloration. And so this can be time consuming, and also you need experts to do this. The United States actually sends all of our samples out to Poland to be identified down by one group of women. Larvae are also not the best tool for hind casting spawning locations. They can be days to weeks old or even months old when collected. And their movement is behaviorally modulated, meaning they can use pressure, temperature, and chemical cues to move in and out of the water, water column. And they have fins to do this. And so they can use um, what's called vertical migration, where they move up and down in the water column to move in and out of currents to get to where they would like to settle. Also, one thing that makes it a little complicated is that late, sta late stage larvae can actually evade these nets that we use to collect them. So they can move away from them when they see them coming. They can't see them. In one study by Burkhart and other authors in 2014, they studied an area called Terracia Bay, which is right here on this map, which is not too far from us. It's about a 13 mile swim across Tampa Bay. <laughs> <laughs> so, in this study, they, show, they looked at larvae composition and egg composition of the different species found in this area. They found they were completely independent of one another, meaning that the larvae found, the species of the larvae found, were not the same species that the eggs found in this area. So we need to be able to study something different other than larvae to get closer to where these spawning locations are. One thing we could use are fish eggs. This is the earliest life stage of any fish, and this could be our new spawning habitat tool. Fish eggs are only hours old when collected, up to about 24 hours and sometimes a little more than that, depending on the water temperature. And so they're way closer to spawning zones. They're also considered passive particles for the most part. All they do is float to the surface. And so once they're at the surface, they just kind of go with the flow, they move with the currents. In this photo on the top right, you can see a fish egg at the tip of a pencil. So they're very small, and they're pretty much like a ball of cells. One question I have for you is, can anyone tell me what species this fish egg is? <laughs> Good, because neither can I. <laughs> so we know, we know that this can be very difficult to visually identify them. There are experts that can do this, and they do this based off of the color of the eggs, the shape, the oil globule, which is the top right. Also, if there are hairs on the eggs, and the yolk shape. So, they can do this, but it's usually not down to the species level and sometimes barely even down to the family level. In this photo here on the right, you can see an arrow pointing to one egg. This egg looks a little different than the others. This one is an anchovy egg, and that's a clupeoid, and so we can identify these ones and pick them out of the samples, but all the other ones are other perchomorphs that are spiny rayed fishes. They all look the same, pretty much. In one paper in 2016 by Larson and other authors, they showed that all of their morphological IDs or visual IDs were completely wrong when compared to the genetic barcodes. And so this can be very difficult, and even if they thought they knew what fish species they were, they were not the right species. And so that brings us into DNA barcoding, or genetic identification of fish eggs. Scientists around the world have been sequencing a conserved gene for a long time, but in 2003, barcoding population grew when Paul Herbert, a Canadian biologist, started a conference to make a database particularly for 
this barcode of life or this small region in the genome where we can identify these eggs down to the species level or any animal of interest. He likes to describe this DNA barcoding as like looking at a grocery store barcode. And so if it was this easy, you could just scan the egg <laughs> and get back a product. <laughs> it's not that easy. <laughs> but it's a great way to understand it. And so in a grocery store, you have a barcode made up of numbers. These numbers are 0 through 9. And there's about 15 in each barcode. And that can identify every single product in the grocery store just by scanning it. Well, with DNA, we need to use a little bit more code because DNA is made up of four different letters, A, C, G, and T. And so if compared to nine or 10 different numbers, you need to have a lot more going on. There's a lot more species in the world than there are products in the grocery store. And so the barcodes are typically around 600 base pairs or 600 letters. And so DNA barcoding has been super popular. There are now thousands and thousands of barcodes of animals. And the fish community has also picked up on this. And so the fish community can use things like fin clips, where they take a little tiny piece of the fish's fin and identify it down. Or they can use a muscle sample, like just puncture a piece of the muscle out. They can look at cryptic species, so identifying species that look exactly the same to us. They can use their DNA to figure out which ones they are. Looking at gut contents, the stomach contents that get broken down, you can't tell what they are inside. And also larvae and eggs. And so DNA barcoding is a great tool that can use in any area of interest around the world. Our particular area of interest is the Gulf of Mexico, which is right outside our window. And so the Gulf of Mexico is the ninth largest body of water in the world, so it's pretty important. It also produces a lot of fisheries <coughs> for us to handle. And so something special about the Gulf of Mexico is that about half of the water is continental shelf. And so that's shallow water, it's typically about 120 meters at the most. And these are all along the edges of the Gulf of Mexico. We can also call this area the neuritic zone. In the center, we have the oceanic zone. This is the deeper area in the darker blue. And this area can be up to 4,000 meters deep. So that's pretty deep, pretty drastic difference. So the goals of this study, we had two different studies in my thesis. And the goals of them were the same for both studies. The first goal was to determine the spatial distribution of eggs belonging to different species on and off the continental shelf, and to determine the encounter rates of eggs from economically valuable species. In the first study, we looked at the Gulf of Mexico as a whole. And so there were three cruises that collected eggs. Um, in these cruises, they were cruises of opportunity, meaning this was not just for the egg collection. It was for um, longline fishing as well. And so eggs were collected on the coast or on the continental shelf, and then also across the Gulf of Mexico and the deeper waters as well. And these were done in 2015, 2016, in different seasons. And now I will walk you through the methods. So the collections were done with a bongo plankton net, and it's 333 microns, micrometers, and they were done at the surface. And so toes were collected for about 15 minutes, depending on the amount of biomass in the water. And so once these plankton nets were brought back onto the surface, everything's collected in the bottom. And there was 50% isopropanol added to each of those collections in order to preserve the samples. These samples contain things like plankton, fish eggs, larvae, and sometimes even plant material. So it's not just eggs in these, in these toes. Once they are brought back to the lab, Jeremy, who's in the bottom right, bottom right picked out about 100 eggs per site for me to process using a stereo microscope. He then gives me a vial full of eggs, and I pick out ones individually and put them into their own separate tubes. And we like to call this whole method hot shot egg extraction <laughs> or extraction. If you're unfamiliar with that, it's the process of breaking out the DNA or extracting the DNA from the sample. And this is a quantitative approach. So each egg is individually processed. We can see which egg what species each egg belongs to. I then add 50 microliters of lysis buffer to help break up the cell. I manually break up the fish egg using a toothpick to lyse the, back, to lyse the um, material out of the, out of the fish egg or lyse the DNA out. I heat it at 95 degrees Celsius for about 30 minutes to continue to break up those cells to release that DNA. And then I add a 50 microliter neutralization buffer 
and that is my DNA product. I then do what's called a polymerase chain reaction. In a polymerase chain reaction, we add some DNA, we add primers and a master mix in order to elongate the DNA over and over again, and we use primers that are called CO1, and CO1 stands for cytochrome C oxidase 1 subunit. It's a highly conserved part of all animal mitochondrial genomes, and this is about 1 15th of the whole mitochondrial genome. It's a very small portion, it's about 600 base pairs or 600 letters in length. And so this is conserved, meaning the primers can connect to an area that is all the same in all the different fish species or if all the different animals. And the area in between is variable, so there's different letters for each species. So we can tell what each species is just by using this small area. Like I said, with a PCR, we amplify this gene over and over again until we get lots of copies. And that's done at different times and different cycles to repeat this section. And that's six, about 600 base pairs long. I then do what's called a gel, run what's called a gel electrophoresis, where I take my product from the PCR and I run it in this gel that separates the DNA based off its length. And so, as you can see on the left, there's what's or like different um, lengths. And so you can see the top ones are 600 base pairs or 600 letters, and it goes down to about 100 base pairs or 100 letters. And so the longer ones will take longer to go through the gel because there's lots of stuff in the way. But we're looking for particularly 600 base pairs. So that is where the band is located. If it shows up, that means we have the DNA there, and that's what I like, and that's what I said for sequencing. <laughs> And so once I get back the sequences from the company, I put them in the Barcode of Life database. And so I get back a bunch of letters for each separate egg, and I paste them into the bold database. And it gives me back a species name to identify it. And so this, this database has over 20,000 different ray fin spe fish species. So that's a lot of things to match to, and that's what we are looking at. So the results for this first project in the whole entire Gulf of Mexico, I processed 1,727 eggs, so individually crushed that many eggs, and got back 709 successful sequences or successful IDs. And that gave us back 82 different taxa IDs. And 36 out of the 40 station had eggs, so some of them didn't have eggs, some of them had less than 100 eggs, so if in that case, we processed all of them. To bring you back to the goals, the first goal was to determine the spatial distribution of eggs belonging to different species on and off the continental shelf. And so I worked with Ernst to create um, a Simprof multivariate analysis of this data, and we got back a nice heat map. This heat map shows at the top the stations, and so one meaning the first cruise, and then after that which station location, three meaning the third cruise, and after that which station location. But that's not really what we're looking at, what we're looking at is the different shapes here. And so you can see that there's red triangles, blue triangles, green squares, they're all different. And so these are the different groups um, or analyzed groups that are similar to each other for the different stations. And on the left side, you can see the top most important species or the most statistically important species. And so what I really want to show you here is that the oceanic species are grouping together. And so all of the triangles are all very close together and all oceanic species. These are all oceanic species here. And the neuritic species are all grouping together as well. And so all of the shapes on the right side are all in the same area and these are all neuritic species. And so it's a little difficult to understand unless you look on a map. And so looking at this map, if I circle the neuritic egg identifications, we can see that they're on the continental shelves. This is exactly where we had expected them to be because neuritic species will spawn in the same area that they live. And so there was one case where one of the squares was out a little deeper. In this case, um, it was species like tuna that can move on and off the continental shelf. And so like I said, neuritic fish spawn in the area where they're living, which is close to the bottom. They get fertilized, they float to the surface, we can collect these eggs. 
The most abundant neuritic eggs that we saw were rough scad, dusky flounder, grunts, and pearly razorfish. And then, when you look at the oceanic egg identifications, you can see that they are typically in deeper waters. And so oceanic fish species are spawning in deeper locations where they live. They are fertilized and they float to the surface. So even though these fish are in different areas, we can still collect their eggs no matter where they live. The most abundant oceanic eggs we are seeing were blackfin tuna, drift fish, striped escolar, and skipjack tuna. The second goal of this project was to determine the encounter rates of eggs from economically valuable species. In the parentheses is how many different stations these fish were seen. So we had red snapper at one location, dolphin fish, red drum, vermilion snapper, gag grouper, and scamp eggs. So the whole conclusions for this first study were that we saw neuritic fish eggs are typically found on the continental shelf, and that oceanic fish eggs are typically found in deeper waters. And we also saw these economically important species that could be important for fisheries managers to understand where the fish are spawning. Something else that the study was important for is for a different study. And so we needed to understand if neuritic eggs were only found on the continental shelves and if, or if they were found also in oceanic waters because in the next study, we wanted to see where we should sample. And so I'll talk about the study at the very end, um, but we needed to understand this concept to be able to use it for future studies. The second study site for this thesis was Cuba. So we got to zoom in a little bit on the right side to where the Florida Straits are in between Florida and Cuba. And Cuba has a couple unique habitats. So you may be familiar that when you go to Cuba, people look, like to look at the reefs. And these reefs are very close to the coast. And if you can see in this picture, this light blue is, is shallower water, and this dark blue is very deep water. So it's a very drastic drop off. It's about 70 degrees down from the continental shelf down to this deeper water. In the Florida Straits, the average depth is about 1,800 meters. And so that's a very drastic drop off from 120 meters. <laughs> and so these reefs are on this shallow area. And then we have this deeper area in the middle. There's also a current that goes across here, and that's the Florida Straits. So that goes right through to the right. The collection sites for this study were a transect across the Florida Straits and along the northwest coast of Cuba, really close, as close to shore as possible. This was also um, a cruise of opportunity, meaning this was not just for fish egg collection, it was also for longline fishing. So the, the methods for this study were exactly the same. The fish spawn, we collect the eggs, we pick individual eggs out, I extract the DNA, and identify them down to the species level if possible. The only difference here is that there was a preservation and processing problems. And so the preservation for these samples was in 30% isopropanol, and it was in supposed to be 70% isopropanol. So in the first study, we had 50%, we tried to up it, but there was miscommunication, so it was 30% isopropanol instead, significantly less. One half of the samples were also processed after a whole year after being collected. And so they sat in kind of like this gunk of all the plankton and plant matter and any other things that were in these samples. So the first batch of eggs were processed within two months and they had 58% processing success, while the ones that sat for over a year had only a 14% processing success. And so in future studies, we should make sure to preserve with greater than 50% alcohol and within six months of collection if not as soon as possible. Overall resor results from this for the second study are that I processed 1,562 eggs. So just do a qu quick math in your head to see how many I processed over this whole master's with the help of an intern. <laughs> and also um, we identified 564 of those eggs to 89 different tax IDs. And 21 out of these 23 stations had successful IDs. Again, to bring you back, the first goal of this project was to determine the spatial distribution of eggs belonging to different species on and off the continental shelf. And so 
We have it highlighted in yellow are reef associated fish or fish that are normally found near reefs. And in black, you can see oceanic associated eggs, usually found in deeper waters. When I say eggs, I'm talking about eggs and species, but the species are normally found in this area. The eggs we are seeing are also found in the same areas. And so if you see a little circle like this one here, that means there are no eggs there. Something stood out to me here. There was a green circle further off the continental shelf than we had expected. And so in this particular station, we saw eggs of early razorfish, snapper, um, sand perch, and grunt. And so these are typically found on the continental shelf. So that kind of stood out to us. We were wondering what was going on. We decided to partner with Dr. Hu and his student Ying Jun. Luckily, they had been studying this same area, looking at satellite images. Ying Jun gave me back this really cool image on the left, which is a uh, chlorophyll snapshot from May 10th. This collection was done in May 24th across the Florida Straits. And so we see here, I don't know if you could see it, but I can see it, so I circled it for you. <laughs> there is a cyclonic eddy right here. And so the star is showing that station that was highlighted in green that we saw a little further off the coast, and that was F7. And so this snapshot is showing that there's an eddy pulling water from the continental shelf off into deeper waters. And so I also wanted to make sure this was OK. So we wanted to see something else. And so we looked at the sea surface height anomalies. And so that's what the, the right image is showing. And so the arrows are pointing in the direction of the water movement. And it is showing the same thing, that we're seeing water being pulled off the continental shelf of Florida and into the deeper waters. And that's where we're collecting our eggs. And so if this were to happen with an egg being spawned on the shelf and getting pulled out, it could also be pulled all the way along the coast of Florida. And so by the time it gets up there, it's probably a larvae by then. But when we collected it, it was in deeper waters. So this was, this was interesting. It was something different that we had not seen previously. We saw that, that neuritic fish were spawning on the continental shelves and oceanic fish were spawning in deeper waters. And so this is showing that they're probably spawning still on the continental shelves, but the eggs can be moved with these physical properties. The second goal of this project was to determine the encounter rates of eggs from economically valuable species, again. And again, in the parentheses, you can see how many different stations these eggs were found at. And so for this particular study, we saw skipjack tuna, dolphin fish, blackfin tuna, and big eye scad. We saw blackfin tuna a lot. <laughs> we also saw something very interesting that we hadn't seen previously, and the fishermen like to call it the billfish grand slam. And that is when you get all these different billfish in your whole lifetime, you catch them on a line. But I got to catch them within my master's degree. <laughs> And so we got sailfish, blue marlin, white marlin, and swordfish to add to that. So that was something interesting that we saw. We also saw many colorful reef fish that we had not seen in the first study. And so we thought, saw things like blue tang, stoplight parrotfish eggs, brass eggs, and butterflyfish eggs. And so we had not seen eggs from these species in our previous study looking at the whole Gulf of Mexico. And so it makes sense for us to find them in Cuba since we have all these reefs here. And we're looking really close to those reefs. The conclusions for the second study were that neuritic fish eggs can be transported off the continental shelf and into deeper waters. And so even though they may be away from the spine locations, they're still closer than the larvae would be. And so this, this, this is still OK. We're still seeing something that we are interested in looking back at. We're also seeing more economically important fish eggs were located with the study. Um, and also, we saw the spawning of colorful reef fishes that we had not seen previously in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, there are shortcomings to DNA barcoding. One of them is that we don't always get down to the species level. And so you saw probably that I said taxa instead of species. And so that can be things like family, genus, or species. Um, but typically, we get down to the species level. In one particular case, we had samples coming back as either bluefin tuna or skipjack tuna. And if you all know, bluefin tuna are these huge tuna that are known to spawn in the Gulf of Mexico, but they don't know exactly what, where they're spawning. And we saw some eggs, and we were like, OK, well, we need to make sure 
that these are either bluefin or skipjack. If they're bluefin, it's really cool. If they're skipjack, eh. <laughs> so I did another PCR using a different region of the genome, and we found out they were skipjack. But we can do these PCRs um, or use different parts of these genomes in order to get down to the species level if we really need to. These are also individual DNA extractions. Like I said, I processed each of these individually. It takes a lot of time. DNA also degrades. So as we saw, if we let these samples sit for a long time, we can have varying success rates from 0% at one site to 100% at the next. So we need to make sure we're staying constant with the amount of time it takes for us to process them and the amount of alcohol used to preserve them. It's also a destructive sampling method. Once I process the eggs, I can't get them back. They're gone. <laughs> so I can't do the extraction again if it doesn't work. Overall, we had two major conclusions for this whole master's. So I found that in study one, it shows that there's a clear delineation between the neuritic fish species are spawning on the continental shelf and that the oceanic species are typically found in deeper waters. But in study two, we saw that physical movement can mess this all up. And so, <laughs> yes, they're still probably spawning on the continental shelf, but we're collecting them in different areas. So we have to make sure to understand all these processes to combine our different skills of the college in order to understand what is going on in a broader scope. The implications of this whole entire project is that we're seeing a lot of biodiversity just by collecting eggs out of the surface of the water. It's not a hard thing to do using these plankton nets. And so we can see any broadcast spawners. Most fish are broadcast spawners, so we can see a lot of different species. We're also seeing new spawning information. In particular, for the second study, we saw luvar eggs. And the only place they had seen luvar spawning before is when they looked at larvae near the southwest Atlantic and also near Japan. So it's nowhere near here, and we're seeing a new spawning location for these fish. They're also kind of goofy looking. <laughs> then we also saw um, platefish spawning activity. So previously, they had only known they had seen the fish spawning near Bonaire in the South Caribbean. And so now we're seeing them more in the North Caribbean. And also, we have the brilliant palm fret, which they had seen juveniles, only juveniles, not even larvae near the Pacific and Japan. So we're seeing a spawning location for them as well. We also saw ecologically and economically important species spawning occurrences, which can provide useful information for multiple countries, including the United States, Mexico, and Cuba, all surrounding the Gulf of Mexico. It also provides valuable baseline data. So we have never done a study like this in the Gulf of Mexico before. So this is a pretty big deal to see what kind of fish species we're seeing spawning in this area. For future work, I told you I'd come back to it. We had used that first study to figure out um, where fish were spawning in order to see where to collect the eggs for the shelf project. And so the shelf project is the spawning habitat and early life linkages to fisheries continuation. In the first um, edition of the shelf study, adults were collected and eggs were collected and to see if these economically important species were spawning in this area and how much they were spawning. In this new edition, we're only collecting eggs, and that's going to be at 68 different stations. And so that is more than I've ever processed, <laughs> processed eggs before. There's a whole lot of different stations only on the West Florida shelf, so right close to home. So instead of processing them all individually, we're going to be moving towards metabarcoding. And this, we will put all of the eggs into one vial, squish them all up together, and process them as a whole for each station. And so with this, it's much less time consuming. Um, we get back a bunch of different sequences for that one station. The only problem is it's not um, quantitative like our first study. Um, it is going to be, it's there or it's not. We see the species there or we don't see it there. So it's a little bit different, but it's still useful for us. And with that, I would like to acknowledge my committee, especially my advisor, my Breitbart, <laughs> Jeremy Browning for picking all the eggs, Eva, my intern for helping me process all of them, Sean Min and Ying Jun for helping us with the second study, my whole lab who is here and has helped me with this presentation, Liz who helped mentor me, Mason, my husband, my family who is here to support, and everyone else that helped collect the eggs on the ships doing that, and of course USF as a whole. I'll take questions.
And then this is just the mic. Oh, okay. um, it's not going to amplify your voice at all, just for us to pick it up oh. on the video. Yeah. And so anywhere. Did you guys um, live stream? Or yeah. Are you yeah. Live? yeah. Uh, Libby. Caitlin, nice to meet you. What, um, what are you using for live streaming? Are you uh, using Facebook Live or something? Uh, YouTube. YouTube. The YouTube channel at CMS. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I, I don't even know if I knew that YouTube had a live stream option. <laughs> I, did, I definitely did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. so um, they'll send out a link to like all CMS, and then if some if people aren't able to actually be here, then they can okay. just watch it. Or if you want to send the link to yeah. Okay. I should, yeah. I think we're Facebook live. Okay. Time, but I'm not, like, starting to set that up, but yeah, last time I was like, no I problem. I was doing the first part of the presentation last time, and I was trying to Facebook live, so it was just a little Oh, uh, too much. Yeah. That is one of my biggest weaknesses yeah, too. Yeah, <laughs> that whole like independent woman thing. <laughs> I just feel like I've usually had interns and just like this year and yeah. I'm like, no, I'm not gonna pick that up again. Yet. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I don't have help. <laughs> So I'm going to continue to pick your brain about the sabbatical thing because yeah. it's something I've been thinking about for the last couple of years and have kind of just been pushing it off. Yeah. Was it difficult to, like, I mean, like, did was there a lot of back and forth? I've heard that sometimes if they don't like your application, they'll um, kind of... Officially, my application's not in. So okay. <laughs> so, yeah, like, at first, the first thing I heard was, like, they wanted it six months ahead of time. And so, like, I just kept putting it off in the fall and, like, stressing about it. I knew I wanted to start like, June 1st. So then I think it was like the middle of the beginning of February, I think, where I'm like, I'm just going to like make a phone call. And so I just called up to the HR, I mm -hmm. say HR office, and I guess I, I guess she's in charge, and it's Susan Hudson. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so um, and she was really good to talk to. She's like, really, the six months is so you can get yourself in order, like, because that's a lot to, yeah. of moving parts to figure out. She's like, on our end, the paperwork is really just about six weeks to process. Oh, okay. So I'm like, okay. Um, and you need a letter of support from, I forget how it's written, but for me it would be my district director. Mm -hmm. um, Ramona, so Ramona's putting in as well. Um, so Ramona put 
Oh, would it be like a joint button. project? Or? No, no, we're just different times. Like, it's funny because she was going to, I think she was originally going to do hers. I don't remember if it was last year or two years. Ago. I don't remember if we both put ours off a year. You know, yeah. I got cancer. So, but yeah, so she put hers <laughs> off um, as well. So yeah, she's putting in her, I think like August to them, whatever, six months. Okay. Um, and so she submitted hers up without having a letter yet from Brenda. I think just thinking like this is the first step. For mm -hmm. her. So it's like you submit and it's just a one page form that has like nothing on it. And then you attach you're like two to five page proposal and then a CV on it. And okay. That's kind of it. And so when I talked to Brenda today, she's like, um, it was kind of like, I met with her in JP. It was supposed to be my annual eval, but she had to reschedule and she had a funeral. So she's like, okay, we can talk about your professional development and we'll do your eval in a few weeks. So, um, yeah, so right now it's like, you know, I keep thinking about travel. Like I want to do a lot of things, but I'm like put less on paper. You know, yeah. Because whatever, I'm going to put on paper is going to be more than what someone else so I knew, so what first kind of got me inspired for what to do as well is like I was reviewing award applications for one of the awards I got a few years ago, like for Mildred and mm -hmm. actually, Mildred Watkins, whatever her husband's name is. <laughs> and um, Julie Dillard had put in um, that, that on her sabbatical, she was basically going to create an online course, like learn the software, yeah. do it. And that's what I've been saying I was going to do like forever, but I haven't found the time to do it. So. Um, so that's kind of what I'm saying. Yeah. So right now I'm, I wanted some sort of professional development. So right now I'm just I'm saying I'm going to do the, I'm like I'm saying I'm going to, I am going to do the um, America, the ACCO. It's like Climate Change Officers mm -hmm. Association. Oh hi. Hello. I didn't mean to interrupt. No. It's <laughs> good to see you. Hi, Lisa. Hello, nice Molly. My graduate advisor. Oh. Um, <laughs> we were just the lineage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were just talking because I'm putting in for like professional development leave, which is our mm -hmm. sabbatical equivalent. Mm -hmm. and Lisa hasn't done that yet, so she could as well. And so, yes, I've yeah. been thinking about it, and just one of those things of yeah. actually doing advice. it. I am Lisa. Oh, hi. Hi. is my name. I just wanted to say hi. Oh, very nice I'm to meet just you. A member of the public. Uh, to be a fly on the wall. Yeah. For you. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Here's my card. By the way. Great. Thank you. Ooh, I don't know if I brought cards. <laughs> I'm take notes, just so you okay. Know. <laughs> and I guess they are recording it here in the. That's I didn't know that. Yeah. 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 There you see, and then um, yeah, she's going to talk as well with Eden Island tonight. Oh, really? um, oh, wow. A little bit different. Mostly the same, right? Lisa, but more in depth into the. Oh, really? Yeah. They're yeah. slightly different. Yeah. But good, good. Probably not put my name tag upside down. <laughs> Brenda's main takeaway from Tom Lisa was like, just don't make it look like vacation. <laughs> what you write up. <laughs> but apparently, like, Ramona said one woman, I forget who it was, but, like, they went around and camped, you know, for six months or whatever, but she visited different extension offices, which, which I did think. I was like, yeah, I could do, like, you know, every six years, just take a different part of the country and visit the sea grant programs and integrate yourself. Well, that honestly was part of the reason why I haven't done it yet is because I'd like to integrate. Oh, look, I have one really scuzzy card left. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> I want to integrate travel into it and just personally right now, it's not a great time to just. No, I'd say you want to go to American Samoa and see. Um. <laughs> I could go see Kelly. Kelly. Oh, yeah, she's funny. Actually, I totally forgot about that. I have a friend in American Samoa too. You can make like a thing of it. <laughs> I said I have a friend in America Samoa too. One of my former students is the University of Hawaii. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah, I forget that she's I should tell her I'm going to Maui, but that's like a cancer recovery. Congratulations on doing the, the Skyway. Yeah, thanks. I'm so sore. I'm like, I don't think I'm going to do it next year. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm always in awe of you. I don't. Yeah, I just like, sorry. I'm like, all right, just going to keep going. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, but I told you that my neighbor across the street, um, she had uh, breast cancer when her son was, her youngest son was about. Do you remember those old pictures we saw? 
18 months old or something uh -huh. like that. And uh, her son just turned 25. Like wasn't oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel so bad for like that. I mean, you feel bad for everyone, but like the young mom. So I was at math at like mm. last week for, I don't know, some appointment. Um, and then I, I, had, I think I got my Zolodex shot, and so then you go to the, the fifth floor, which is kind of weird, because that's where you got chemo and everything. It's just kind of weird to be back there, but there was, there was a young woman, and she was like, looks like seven to eight months pregnant. And like, oh. the chemo happened, and I was like, mm. like it happens. It's, really it's, not, it's not common, it's but I forget. I don't know how they do the chemo and everything. I don't know. Well, Katie Sosa was diagnosed yeah. within months after so having her triplets, I think. She had she had one, and then she had triplets. It was in uh, it was in not induced, but it was she had uh, hormone treatments to and and uh, and so so she suddenly has four under the age of three and. Which is insane to begin <laughs> with. <laughs> yeah, I can't even imagine. Yeah. Her parents actually came and moved out to help her out. But it was like, when was that? Like how? Well, let's see. She her publication, I think, is about 2003. I think her so, and that came out. Just, I, I, not that difference in time from when she uh, when she was because uh, it was several years after. Got her degree. I don't. I'd have to look okay. back to see what time she, when she got her degree. But it was in the. It was. It was. It was a good ten to fifteen years ago. And how's Henry? I guess she's doing a little better. She, she's uh, she's home alone now. And, well, home yeah. alone except she got her kitties back. So, uh, the, 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 so at least she isn't home alone now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, the furries are good. They're yeah. good companions. They used to joke about yeah, like, yeah, I mean, Amber must love cancer. I'm like, <laughs> I'm home all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the time it's time. <laughs> it's uh, no, uh, one of these things technology is. I lost Sandy a month ago. And she just, she just, she just, she had congestive heart failure. She went to sleep and didn't wake up one Monday morning. Oh. And so you already were treating her for congestive heart failure? Like you knew she had congestive heart failure? No, we knew she had a heart murmur, and I don't, I think she had congestive heart failure. There are a lot of things tell me now that she, that she did, but, um, but anyway, it, um, but so we went to the Humane Society on Saturday, and so we have a new... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, not every time. But it was a poor Dusty. I mean, our other, our, yeah, other, our younger dog. Uh, but now he's the older dog. But but he hadn't played. Oh, can't keep up with the newbie, time. huh? <laughs> no, no, no. He had not played the whole uh, he was on his own. He played more this morning. <laughs> this morning. <laughs> then he played the entire time. He did not have. So what did you get? Oh, and I heard I saw one of your like recent students in my recently, and she said you're like that you text and everything. <laughs> She said, by like someone of your new students at a meeting, I think it might have been the Sarasota Climate Change, but was saying that you're in text, that you text on your phone? Yeah, I, 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 I'm not very good. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I'm not very good at typing. Uh, uh, but a I'm woman after my own heart. I am a technological late adopter, <laughs> as they say. Uh, oh, but, but yeah, you can text me. So what, what did you name her? We named her Tuffy, which is for three reasons. One, Tuffy was my first, was well, the first dog that my family had when I was, you know, just really little. So Tuffy and I were the same age, until eight, and then he got put down. But the uh, back. I have one. Oh. <laughs> I think I have two, actually. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Um, will this USB work, or should I put it in there? Does it um, matter? I think try putting it in here. In there? Okay. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure my batteries are live, but. No. I wonder if it's a USB. No. No. I put your thing on the desktop, so if you put it in the exact same. You know that one works. She just downloaded her stuff. Yeah, okay. So let me try. It could, like I said, I don't know if my batteries, or if there's even batteries in this one. <laughs> I can use an arrow button. It's really sure? okay. Yeah. Because okay. we can if, have someone come down and. No, it's not. I have no idea why none of them work. That's really weird. Can I maybe swap out batteries and just see? All right, so that's mine. This is yeah, that's not gonna work. <laughs> oh yeah. <here> <laughs> I'll use the arrow button. Was Don't it working for Mackenzie this morning? Yeah, but she put it in her computer. That's super weird. I'm so sorry. No, don't apologize. Do this are, happens. Are you sure you're comfortable? Yes, I am fine with that. Oh, perfect. Thank you. I downloaded it onto the desktop, so if you want to delete it when you're done. Oh, okay. I'm just going to do one more swap of batteries. And then... Are these ones mine? Those were mine. Oh, no, those are yours. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Too many pieces. Yeah, this was bad. Okay. Nope. Oh, my God, you have a lot of this. I know, you would think with traveling with two, I would get one to work, yeah. but I will just use the arrow button. Okay, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> you don't need a big intro. Do you want? I can introduce myself if you want. Okay. <laughs> questions but someone's gonna have to keep me on time if we do that so because otherwise I'll just keep going <laughs>
So thank you everyone for having me. As Libby said, I'm with the University of Florida IFAS Extension in a new position. So the Water Resource Regional Specialized Agents, there's five of us located statewide, and we're loosely affiliated with each of the water management districts. So we're geographically different, and each of us also has different areas of water specialty. So the kind of theory is, is that between the five of us working together as a statewide team, we can tackle most water resource issues throughout the state in any geographic region. So um, I'm also an affiliate faculty with the Florida Sea Grant Program, and so my background and my uh, water resources focus is primarily um, coastal water quality. And so Libby invited me here today to talk about the blue-green algae, and you can't really talk about the blue-green algae issue without talking about Lake Okeechobee. So in full disclosure, I am not a phycologist, nor am I a limnologist, but I do work very closely and have spent the last few years working with my colleagues who are all of the above. And so I'm going to be presenting a lot of information today. The majority